from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Protecting the plants and animals underwater. These animals share a lot of the same genetics as humans, especially for disease. See the research going on at this unique center. Where did winter go? We do expect to see continued near or above normal temperatures. Could colder temperatures make a return appearance before spring has sprung as cattle prices continue to climb? We're getting into that really tight spot. How much higher could they go? The latest right now on Ag Day. Ag Day, presented by Pioneer. What's next happens when the name on the cap matches the power of one's purpose. Pioneer, what's next happens here. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Feeder cattle supplies are estimated to be at their lowest level since 1972. And right now, that's pushing prices into record territory. Ag Day's Michelle Rook joins us. And Michelle, this could be a sign of things to come. Clinton USDA's cattle on feed report did show feeder supplies down 4.2% from a year ago. And the latest cattle inventory report showed the calf crop the smallest since 1941 at only 33 million head. And there's evidence of this at cell barns across the country as the cash market for feeders and calves has been on fire. For the first week of February, 500 pound steers in Oklahoma posted a new weekly record cash price of 321.34, surpassing the previous high of 312.72 in November 2014. And cash feeders have been near to or setting new records in the north as well. Yeah, cash trade on, on feeders has been red hot and uh, just a continuous climb and and tighter numbers as as kind of we expected you know we had that big run on fall feeders and um, everybody was placing cattle early and now it feels like we're starting to run into where are they we're getting into that really tight spot. Farlake thinks the tight supply may show up in this Friday's cattle on feed report with placement estimates for January averaging around 85 percent of a year ago which is a function of tight supplies and tough winter weather conditions in January. As we start to look at the next cattle on feed report you know, as soon as we turn the page on the last one, we all couldn't wait to get to this one because I think these placement numbers are starting to get penciled in and hearing some pretty friendly numbers. 16% back from a year ago. Feeder cattle have been the leader in the futures market as of late and have continued to make new near-term highs for the move to start this week. Every time they have, you know, one down day, that's really the only correction it's got. I mean, I've been saying this market's been overbought for uh, quite some time now, but it's... Uh, has a one day break and it's finding buyers, it's finding people that want to rally this market up. With Tuesday's highs, March feeder cattle futures have rallied nearly $42 from the new contract low scored in the market on December 7th. The contract is now just $18 off the contract high, which was hit on September 15th at 270.10. I'm a Sherbrook reporting for Ag Day. If it feels more like spring than winter, you're not alone. Warm weather is pouring into the lower 48 and much of the country will see above average temperatures through next week. USDA says it appears spring is as much as two weeks early this year from the Southern Plains to the Carolinas and Southeastern Virginia. And BAMWX saying this winter has been one of the top five warmest ever across the upper Midwest, Great Lakes and New England adding it's also the lowest heating demand winter on record to date. Now, despite widespread cold in January, forecasters say the warming trend is expected to continue into March. We do expect to see continued near or above normal temperatures. The greatest likelihood of those warm conditions focused as they have been all winter across the northern United States. That doesn't mean we can't have cold outbreaks during March. As we saw during January, a warmer than normal month, we had a very sharp cold outbreak right in the middle of the month for about 10 days. So we do have to be concerned with the warm spring that we could see episodic cold outbreaks causing potential harm to winter grains and fruit crops as well as ornamentals. Now take a look at this. Ice coverage across the Great Lakes is now record low due to the well above average temperatures across that region. Now, Rippey says he does expect storms to continue slamming California while the rest of the country sees below or near normal precipitation heading into spring. And the ongoing warming trend is expected to continue over the next several days. Meteorologist Matt Engelbrecht has a look ahead for us. Yeah, we look at that temperature outlook uh, February 25th through the 29th. Uh, we always get caught up in what's going on 
here. But what I want to point out is what's going on up here. We are so far to the right side of the legend uh, that there's nearly an 85 to 90% chance of temperatures being above normal for this time of year during this time period between the 25th and the 29th. As we go back here, uh, you start to see more of the orange, which is just a little bit above normal or the chances that are happening are just a little bit higher. And this is a very big area where confidence is high that during that time period, uh, temperatures are going to be above average. Now we flip that over where there is a ridge, there is a trough and some cooler temperatures back here towards the west coast, including uh, some rain. It's going to be tough to get some moisture in and across the United States in a more traditional rainstorm uh, because of that ridge and that blocking pattern. In Argentina, an invasion of Mosquitoes is affecting the capital. Officials say it's linked to recent rainfall since the mosquito breeds in the rain puddles. According to researchers, a decrease in the number of mosquitoes is expected in a week to 10 days. So until then, I have the bug spray. I have more in your forecast coming up. A developing story we're following. Reuters is reporting the Biden administration appears poised to approve an expansion of E15 starting next year. Now it says the White House will approve a request to allow year round sales of E15 as requested by several Midwest governors. However, it will delay the start until 2025. Reuters says its sources tell them the administration will issue a decision by late next month. And it says in the meantime, EPA could issue a temporary waiver. Reuters reporting the one year delay could potentially put off any price spikes or supply issues the oil industry could claim because of the decision, putting it off until after the election. Now, the EPA has declined to comment on Reuters report. The ethanol industry holding the National Ethanol Conference in San Diego this week, highlighting the importance of E15 and the Renewable Fuels Association also releasing the economic impact of low carbon ethanol and its co-products, saying last year more than 72,000 U.S. jobs were directly associated with the ethanol industry. And it says the industry created 32 and a half billion in household income and contributed just over $54 billion to the nation's gross domestic product, calling it the second highest GDP contribution ever. Meanwhile, the National Cotton Council releasing its survey on acreage for this year. It says U.S. cotton producers intend to plant 9.8 million acres. That's down about 3.7% compared to last year. Cotton futures starting the week strong above $91 per hundred, although harvest season prices are still in the low to mid 80s. Flip Your Soil on Ag Day is brought to you by ESN. Hear how farmer Heath Cottrell achieved award-winning corn yields with ESN Smart Nitrogen. Learn more at smartnitrogen.com. Many farmers across the country have been flipping their soil to make it more productive for decades and in all types of topography and soil types. Jacob Caterley says his father started minimum till on their farm in Judah, Wisconsin back in the 60s and he switched to 100% no-till when he bought the land in 2005. He also added cover crops to boost yields and he plants row crops right into the growth. I plant six varieties of things and, uh, and then wheat is seven so we got uh, peas and oats, sorghum sedan, uh, tillage radish, hairy vetch, and red clover. But the covers are adding to organic matter. In seven years, I've built a half a percent of organic matter. Now that's led to higher fertility levels on his farm and pushed his yields. We've done some testing and we've made anywhere from 80 to 100 pounds of N for the corn crop the next year. And most years, uh, corn fall on that wheat with that cover crop as an extra 20 bushel yield. Jacob placed in the top 10 several times in the National Corn Growers Association yield contest no-till division. His highest, 273 bushels to the acre. Ukraine taking a stance against protesting Polish farmers after it's reported they scattered Ukrainian grain on railroad tracks. Ukraine's infrastructure minister calling the move a quote, political provocation aimed at dividing our nations. Farmers in Poland have increased their protest against cheap Ukrainian grain imports and the EU's Green Deal. They have vowed to continue their demonstrations for 30 days, which started on February 9th. Now, farmers have also been blocking access routes to border crossings with Ukraine. 
Wheat markets surge on Tuesday. We'll take a look at what's pushing those prices as winter wheat fields come out of dormancy next. And later, we're looking at the building blocks of aquatic life with researchers in Louisiana. Bayer is planning a drastic cut when it comes to dividends. The company says the proposal comes as it faces a high level of debt coupled with high interest rates and what it calls a challenging free cash flow situation. Bayer saying it will offer investors a legal minimum required under German law, which equates to about 12 cents in U.S. dollars per share for 2023. Now, Farm Journal analyst Jim Wiesmeyer says it represents about a 95% cut. CEO Bill Anderson saying the decision to only pay out a legal minimum for the next three years was not taken lightly. USDA reported a flash sale of corn to Japan and a soybean meal sale to the Philippines, with grains having a pretty good day on Tuesday. Ag Day's Michelle Rook has more with Arlen Suderman in Markets Now. Grains all to the plus side on Monday. Arlen Suderman with Stonex is back with us. And Arlen, you know, the pop that we saw in the grains, was it just technical, just mostly short covering by these funds? Yeah, you know, he set the stage for it with the funds holding massive short or sold positions. And they start getting nervous when they and everyone else is short, wondering what headline is going to come out of the Black Sea or the Red Sea to make everyone want to get out at the same time. End users similarly have a, that same concern if they've been going hand to mouth, uh, worried about, well, it's working for them now, but what if a headline comes out of the Red Sea or the Black Sea to make those funds cover? And so we did get that headline over the weekend, and, and that was two grain ships. You know, the Houthi rebels have largely been allowing grain ships to go unscathed as they've been attacking various ships. They've hit container freight ships and oil. But this time they hit two grain ships, one of them now in danger of sinking in the Gulf of Aden. And so concerns are rising. And so the fund's trying to get out of shorts, end users trying to get some coverage. And then the momentum trading algo is going to uh, jump in there to amplify the move. We ended off highs, and it's um, really kind of evident that any rally that we have is going to be sold by farmers, right? Yeah, especially in corn and soybeans. And it's not just a farmer in the United States. Uh, it's the Brazil farmer who's at the slowest pace for selling corn and soybeans that he has been in the last five or six years. So there's a lot of corn and soybeans as we sold on the rallies, and it's really kind of limited the upside today. And we threw a lot of bearish news at the market last week, especially with USDA's projections out of the Ag Outlook Forum. You know, do you think that we have most of that worked into prices already? And going forward, how much confidence do you have in any of those numbers? Yeah, I think they're discounting it a little bit. I think they're expecting a little bit smaller shift. A shift toward beans, yes, but not to the extent that USDA has indicated. And there's models going both ways. It really kind of depends on how quickly we move from El Nino to La Nina. The faster we do, the drier the summer is. But right now, so far, the transition's been pretty slow. All right, thanks for joining us. Arlen Studerman with StoneX. More Ag Day coming up. Contact Arlen Suderman by email at arlen.suderman at stonex.com. All right, look at the forecast coming up, and you can take this Wednesday and then repeat it for next week. We're starting to, starting to see that ridge develop, and it's in between uh, the ridge and the trough that we have the chance, not only of some rain, but also uh, some snowfall. Now, depending on where the jet stream sets up is where those railroad tracks are gonna be set down. So you can see, as we go into Thursday and Friday, now uh, this shallow trough bit of energy kind of squeezes in on this ridge here, and that's where we pick up a uh, chance of maybe some isolated showers. A weakness in the ridge will allow this low pressure system at the surface to develop a little bit more as it approaches the east coast. We're also going to pick up a deeper trough trying to develop back out here to the west. And as we've talked about before, uh, ideal situations, you're looking at this trough developing back here, which means that low pressure system and the rain associated with, with it would expand into a larger portion of the United States. But with the ridge where it is, this trough has to sneak in towards the east coast uh, before it really starts to ramp up and develop into the possibility of some snow and some rain 
along the east coast. So it really minimizes the coverage with the precipitation, also lowers the chances of some you know, more Arctic air or cold air coming in on the back side of the system. So that's why we expect this trough to develop, that things to kind of you know, rinse out with a slow pressure system on the east coast and then get back into a similar pattern, not only this weekend, but next week. Already seen that right there with another ridge developing and a low pressure system just off the coast. So pun intended, rinse and repeat with this kind of forecast. So looking at the jet stream, a very similar situation, just a little bit higher above our heads. This is Wednesday and into Thursday. You have that uh, weak trough, which normally would be developing back here toward the west, is more to the east. As that works out with some colder air, another ridge of high pressure down here towards San Antonio is what's going to be building in Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday of next week. So that's where that warmth comes in for an extended period of time. Watching that for a potential storm system, maybe a weak clipser system by next Thursday. Colorado, we got some evening snow showers high around 37 degrees. A Buckeye, Arizona, partly cloudy, 72 degrees. Speaking of uh, Buckeye, Columbus, Ohio, partly cloudy, high about 59 degrees, low of 43. The pork industry is continuing to push for U.S. exports. Pork business editor Jennifer Scheich recently speaking with Courtney Nupp of the Pork Checkoff. She says working together with USDA and the U.S. Meat Export Federation, they've been able to push red meat trade across the globe. And she says this year they have trips planned for Vietnam, Korea, and Canada. So it shows the foresight of our producers decades ago when we entered into the trade promotion space. Because again, we wanted to create long-term value. We wanted to develop markets. A lot of markets like Colombia, we're seeing Philippines and Vietnam, where we initially started decades ago to introduce our product. Our products are now staples in those market, and we now have the ability to try and move from not just going into further processing, but creating a U.S. pork brand for our exporters at retail and food service to drive more values, consumer-facing campaigns and uh, it's really worked well. Nup says the pork checkoff is still focused on the 70% of U.S. pork that gets consumed in the U.S., but says exports are 30% of production. Smithfield has a new head of hog production. It announced Craig Westerbeek will take over the job at the end of the month. The company says Westerbeek brings more than 30 years of industry experience to his new role. His career with Smithfield began back in 1983 as an environmental manager for Quarter M Farms, which later became Murphy Family Farms. He also served three years as vice president in support operations for the company's hog production. Now we know protecting germplasm is important for the future of crops. It's also important for plants below the surface in the water. We'll look at what's happening in Louisiana next. Preserving genetic material for aquatic species is the mission of the LSU Ag Center Aquatic Germplasm and Genetic Resource Center. As Craig Gotro reports, these animal and plants play important roles in commercial aquaculture and biomedical research. A plethora of aquatic species can be found throughout the LSU Ag Center Aquatic Germplasm and Genetic Resources Center. Some of the animals at the center no longer exist in the wild or are critically endangered, making its work crucial to their survival. It's got a very clear mission to preserve the genetic resources of fish and shellfish. And we work every day uh, to come up with new ways to do that. Some species at the center play key roles in biomedical research that humans can directly benefit from. These animals share a lot of the same genetics as humans, especially for disease. And so rather than use monkeys and dogs and mice, biomedical research is shifting to these small, cheap, easy to grow aquatic species. 3D printers are found throughout the facility and are an indispensable tool used by scientists to develop specialized equipment that can handle extreme temperatures. It may seem strange, but they're there because it gives us this capability to make new things, to test them, to break them and refine them and then distribute them to other people. Some of the hardware developed there is shared openly with the public and other groups with similar missions. 
This sharing can reduce research costs and save time for other researchers. That way, they don't have to go to some very expensive place with very expensive equipment that may be far away. They can do it right there in their own location. Tier says it is imperative to preserve genetic material and believes this area could lead to multi-billion dollar business opportunities. With the LSU Ag Center, this is Craig Gotro reporting. All right, thanks, Craig. And that's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in. From all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day.